You're listening to the Index Investing Show. This is America's only weekly program focused on the important stock and bond indexes and the financial products that track them. And now presenting your host, Ron DeLegend. Coming up on today's program, lingo that every ETF investor should know. Also on the program, John Love, CEO at USCF Investments, will be joining us a little bit later. We'll be talking about commodities. We've seen some incredible moves to the downside in crude oil and to the upside, natural gas. So what's going on with commodities? Uh, Stay tuned for that. Also, if you'd like to join us to talk about a particular stock, mutual fund, or ETF, we're here, 844-305-7800. You can also hit our Twitter feed at Index Show and tweet the program live. I'll also share what's uh, what's on my mind and and what's on our Twitter feed uh, a little bit later. So taking a look at uh, our topic for today, lingo that every ETF investor should know. You know, every genre within Wall Street has its vocabulary, has its lingo. Uh, For example, in the venture capital world, it's all about seed investment. It's all about term sheets and the harvest period. That particular aspect or category within Wall Street has its lingo. And and it's the same anywhere else. It's the same with, uh, you know, uh, the bond market. It's the same with um, private equity. And and, uh, with exchange-traded funds, this particular category... It's uh, It also has its own lingo. And if you're investing in ETFs, also known as exchange-traded funds, I think there's a couple of uh, key pieces of lingo that uh, you should know. And I want to cover those on today's program. We're going to examine uh, a few of these words, these vocabulary uh, p- that pertains to exchange-traded funds to help you better understand exactly what it means. We're going to demystify these things. So um, I want to get into that on today's show. Now, before we share with you what the first word or lingo is, I want to just give you a quick recap of what's going on here in uh, financial markets. We saw the S&P 500 rising almost 5% this past week as uh, the broad U.S. stock market, uh, as measured by the S&P 500, uh, continues to heal, continues to recover from its October swoon. And we saw each of the 11 industry sectors within the S&P 500 uh, closing up on the week. We saw consumer discretionary was the biggest uh, gainer, up almost uh, 6.5%. Now, that particular sector includes companies like Amazon.com, consumer discretionary, XLY is the ticker symbol. That particular industry sector, by the way, has been a leader pretty much all year long in terms of market performance, and it continues to do well. We also saw a nice bounce in technology stocks, ticker symbol XLK, rising just a, a nudge over 6% on the week. And also, of course, healthcare, XLV as in Victor. XLV tracks the healthcare sector, that's the ETF ticker, ahead by uh, almost 6%. So that's, uh, that's what's going on there. Um, you know, one of the drivers... Wondering what, well, why, why are the stocks going up? Well, one of the drivers, contributing factors, was uh, Cyber Monday, which, uh, which was good for Amazon.com. It jumped 13% on the week. What a move in Amazon.com. Uh, this one, of course, has been beaten down uh, the past uh, almost two months, but we saw a really nice gain. It was, once again, one of the biggest shopping days for online retailers ever, ever in history. So they keep breaking records. You know, we said that last year about Cyber Monday. This will be the biggest uh, online retail sales figures and numbers ever. And and that pretty much uh, is going to be what you're going to be hearing every single year. It's going to be record-breaking every single year just because of that trend. More and more people are choosing to uh, buy their gifts buy their goods online and especially when retailers go crazy and bonkers with uh, with those discounts so that's uh, what's going on there 
Um, in the healthcare sector, uh, Pfizer added uh, just a little over 7% to its stock price and uh, posted a fresh all time high. So that, of course, was lifting the, the healthcare sector. XLV is the ticker symbol there. And then um, in the technology sector, one particular company that stood out, Workday, uh, ticker symbol WDAY, rallied 21% on the week. The company is a provider of cloud computing software. It raised its guidance for 2019 following better than expected results uh, in earnings for fiscal third quarter. So that uh, that's what's going on there in terms of uh, market performance and some of the key industry sectors. We'll get you caught up a little bit later on what's going on with the broader asset classes like commodities and real estate and bonds. So stay tuned for that. 844-305-7800 is the number. You're listening to the Index Investing Show and this is where you find us. This is where we congregate every week to talk about the birds and the bees of successful investing at Index Shows, where you find me on Twitter. If you ever miss our regular radio broadcast, you can pick up our podcast. It's available at IndexShow.com, as well as iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube. So that's, uh, again, where you find us. Uh, coming up in a little bit, John Love, CEO at USCF Investments, will be with us. Uh, the, his company uh, manages a lineup of exchange-traded products linked to various commodities. We're going to get into what those commodities are. There's been some big, big moves, and and traders that have been on the right side of this move have been able to really capitalize, and we're going to talk about some of those big moves in crude oil as well as natural gas. And we're going to talk about some other things. I've got some questions for him about uh, how to hedge against currency weakness. And my thought there is I saw an article uh, or somebody mentioning uh, what, 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 uh, what's going to be coming for the U.S. dollar in terms of price strength, price weakness. And the view was uh, that uh, the U.S. dollar is going to be weak in the future and that the Federal Reserve is going to start monetizing its debt, which would be seriously a bad thing for the U.S. dollar. I mean, once they start monetizing debt, pretty much they're, they're, they're devaluing the dollar. And so what would that mean in terms of investors? How do you hedge against that? How do you, how do you play that? How do you protect against that? So John Love coming up a little bit later on the program. So um, one other thing I want to do on today's show, I want to throw out some trivia. Uh, because I'm going to give away a signed copy of my book, Gents With No Sense, A Closer Look at Wall Street, Its Customers, Financial Regulators, and the Media. And uh, it is a book that's available at Amazon.com. It's five-star rated. And uh, I'm going to give away a copy on today's uh, show to the listener that can accurately and correctly answer this question. Here's, here's the question. In what year was the first U.S. ETF listed for trading? That is the trivia question. In what year was the first U.S. ETF listed for trading? So, 844-305-7800 is the number. Give us a call if you know the answer to that question. Give us your first name along with your city. The listener with the correct answer will get a copy, a signed copy, of my book, Gents With No Sense, A Closer Look at Wall Street, its customers, financial regulators, and the media. I will also whet your appetite with uh, with some tidbits from Gents With No Sense uh, a little bit later, so stay tuned for that. 844-305-7800 is the number. We're here. You can also tweet the answer if you want to uh, participate on Twitter. At Index Show is where you get in touch with us there. I'm Ron DeLegge. This is the Index Investing Show. More just ahead. Go nowhere. The Index Investing Show with Ron DeLegge. Stop investing blindly. Listen to the Index Investing Show with Ron DeLegge every week on iTunes and IndexShow.com. Learn how to grow and protect your money.
Okay, so the trivia, trivia open to the listening audience is this. In what year was the first U.S. ETF listed for trading? If you know the answer to that question, 844-305-7800 is the number. Call us. You'll get a signed copy of my book, Gents With No Sense, a closer look at Wall Street. Now, let me uh, whet your appetite for what is contained within Gents With No Sense. Uh, It's broken down into nine different chapters, just like there's nine innings in a baseball game. And uh, the chapter titled News, Views, and Zoos, uh, under Corrections and Amplifications, it says this, On behalf of all media organizations everywhere, I'd like to make a few editorial corrections. Most of these mistakes are so obvious, nobody's bothered to notice. Take Bernard Madoff's extravagant investment scam which is consistently mislabeled by the media. Calling the immaculate deception a Ponzi scheme isn't just bad reporting, it's blasphemous. While it's true that Charles Ponzi was the originator of multi-level financial perversity, Bernie was the master. Therefore, classifying multi-billion dollar swindles as Madoff schemes, and not something less, is good for humanity as well as for journalism. You will also find the media politely referring to Madoff's throng of duped souls as investors. I'm not sure that they were ever investors any more than buyers of lottery tickets are investors. And if we continue calling them investors, that means that we need to begin calling slot machine degenerates and craps players investors too. Do you see how one bad teaspoon of inaccurate reporting causes a tidal wave of confusion? So what I just read from you was an excerpt from Gents With No Sense, A Closer Look at Wall Street. It is, by the way, the Bear Market Edition. And if you know the answer to that trivia question, you'll get a signed copy. The question again, in what year was the first U.S. ETF listed for trading? 844-305-7800. You can also tweet the answer at Index Show on uh, Twitter. So let's talk about lingo that every ETF investor should know. Let's begin with bid-ask spread. Have you heard this one? Like all individual stocks, ETFs have something called bid-ask spreads. So what does that mean? Well, the bid denotes the price that someone is willing to buy a fund at, whereas the ask is something or is the price that someone is willing to sell at. Now, ETF sellers receive the lower price, that's the bid, while buyers pay the higher price, that's the ask. So bid-ask spreads for high-volume ETFs, like the Spider S&P 500 ETF, for example, SPY is the ticker symbol, you're going to see the bid-ask spreads for those types of ETFs with lots and lots of volume, heavily traded, are quite minimal. And what that does is it reduces the frictional cost for trading for buying and selling those ETFs. On the other hand, thinly traded funds tend to have higher bid-ask spreads, which increases an ETF trader's cost. Now, it's possible that ETFs that may hold very liquid stocks in the portfolio, stocks that are popular, stocks that are heavily traded, it's possible for ETFs that hold those types of stocks to suffer from wider bid-ask spreads because the fund itself may have depressed trading volume. There may not be a lot of action in that ETF. So so for that reason, you would see a wider bid-ask spread. Now, it's a good habit to stick with ETFs that have narrow or minimal bid-ask spreads. Now, that's just a general rule. At the same time, you need to understand that there's certain funds in certain categories that will continue to have wider bid-ask spreads, and so you have to be ready for that. And and actually, it's okay. It's okay to trade or invest in those types of funds that have wider bid-ask spreads because, quite frankly, they may be more narrow markets, more niche markets, markets where you don't really have any other choice if you're looking for exposure. And so that's that's where you're that's where you're going to have to trade and to to acquire exposure. So funds, for example, that are leveraged, 
funds that uh, maybe go short the market, funds that track niche asset classes, for example, a like silver or natural gas or corn or something like that. These types of funds are going to have higher bid-ask spreads compared to a, a broadly diversified equity ETF uh, tracking the total U.S. stock market, for example. So be ready for that. Uh, one tool that I like to use just to kind of get a handle on the level of bid-ask spreads and, and, and what, they, what they are Morningstar.com expresses ETF bid ask spreads in terms of percentages, it's similar to an expense ratio. And I like that. I think it's very helpful for investors. So you can see what the bid ask spread is in a certain ETF. Just type in the ticker symbol at Morningstar.com and you'll see all the data right there. You'll see the 52 week high, the 52 week low. You'll see the expense ratio. You'll see also the bid ask spread. In terms of percentage, and it's expressed like an expense expense ratio, and it's very helpful. You just add that number to your expense ratio, and that kind of gives you a, a a mini snapshot of the total ownership cost of that particular fund. So I think it it's a very helpful tool. It it, it gives you and me as investors a better understanding of an ETF's actual trading cost. So that's the first piece of lingo that every ETF investor should know, bid-ask spreads. Uh, coming up a little bit later, I'm going to share with you a couple other words or vocabulary that are particular to ETFs that you should be familiar with. 844-305-7800 is the number. We're here. If you're just joining us, you'd like to listen or, or uh, join the program. Of course, uh, as I had said earlier, you can listen to our program uh, via the podcast. Just go to indexshow.com. You can also listen to us at YouTube. We're there, and uh, you can find us. Now, coming up uh, in the next segment, we're going to have John Love, CEO at USCF Investments, with us. We've seen some crazy moves in the, the price of crude oil. And, man, what a, what a trading opportunity this has been for your, non, your non-core investment portfolio. Now, they've got uh, two particular ETFs that we're going to talk about. In, in that interview, I want to ask John about, uh, you know, ways to, to trade this. Now, one of their funds is ticker symbol USOD and then USOU. Now, each of those funds basically tracks the same market oil, but in opposite directions. USOD aims to capitalize when oil prices fall. It aims for triple daily opposite performance to crude oil. USOD is the ticker symbol. That fund has gained over 100% over the past month. It has been in a tremendous run to the upside. Of course, uh, its its cousin, which does the exact opposite, USUO, has, uh, has collapsed, has crashed almost 60% over that past month. And that fund, USUO, OU aims for triple daily performance or exposure to crude oil. So that's uh, that's what we're going to talk about how to how to play that trend. You know, do crude oil prices they've come down so much, so fast, so hard. Will that trend continue? Are we going to see a rebound there? And also natural gas. My goodness, natural gas uh, seasonally speaking tends to be stronger in the winter months and uh, it has definitely delivered on its historical or seasonal uh, performance and so we'll talk a little bit about natural gas so stay tuned for that john love ceo at uscf investments coming up next 844-305-7800 is the number this is the index investing show go nowhere Show with Aerospace and defense ETF soaring? For a bold trade in this sector, trade DFEN, Direction's Daily Aerospace and Defense Bull 3X Shares. Don't miss your next big trade, Direction Leveraged ETFs. 
An investor should carefully consider a fund's investment objective, risks, charges, and expenses before investing. A fund's prospectus and summary prospectus contain this and other information about direction shares. To obtain a fund's prospectus and summary prospectus, call 866-476-7523 or visit us at www.directioninvestments.com. A fund's prospectus and summary prospectus should be read carefully before investing. An investment in the funds is subject to risk, including the possible loss of principal. The funds are designed to be utilized only by sophisticated investors, such as traders and active investors. Distributor, Foresight Fund Services, LLC. You're listening to the Index Investing Show with Ron DeLegge. Go to indexshow.com to enroll in Ron's online classes for investors. Learn how to grow and protect your money. Well, we're pleased to have with us John Love, CEO at USCF Investments. One of the 2018 mega trends has been the collapse in oil prices. John, welcome to the Index Investing Show. Great to have you back. Great to be back. Thanks for having me. So USCF offers both bullish and bearish ETFs linked to oil. You've got ticker symbols USOU and then USOD. And we've seen a vicious drop in crude oil prices. It's at the top of many traders' minds. But this drop has obviously favored the bears. Since the beginning of October, USOD has jumped over 130%. My goodness, what a huge move in such a short time. So why the crash in oil prices? And is there any light at the end of the tunnel for a rebound? I, I Yes, I think there is. A, I, I think that this particular crash is probably a little bit overdone. It does make sense why it happened. As we came into October and over the last couple of years, um, we had the oil crash in 2014, 2015, and since 2016, the price has recovered substantially. I think we went up um, somewhere around 190 percent from the low in 2016 uh, to earlier this year. And then, um, basically, what's happened though is that inventories around the world started to rise again after a couple of years of declines. Uh, we always look at where are we related uh, in terms of the amount of oil and storage to where we were last year or where we were five years ago. Uh, or five years on average, and those mu- numbers have been looking good right up until uh, really this fall, and then um, we rose back above the five-year five, five year average again. The other thing that's happened is U.S. Uh, production of crude oil has risen substantially, as you know. Uh, we were, before the oil crash of 2014, the U.S. Pr- was producing less than 10 million barrels a day. We're now producing substantially more than that. Uh, we had a decline for a while, but we're back. Uh, we're approaching uh, almost 12 million barrels a day, and that uh, is probably a mark we'll hit in 2019. So those are bearish factors. Um, the other thing is that OPEC, uh, while they still uh, had cuts nominally in place, they had reduced uh, compliance with those cuts uh, to kind of make up for the oil that was coming off the market from Venezuela and from Iran. And what you had recently that didn't help is the the waivers that the government granted uh, to buyers of Iranian crude, uh, meaning that there was more of a surplus. There was more oil in the market than than, uh, participants uh, expected. And I think that's really what's driven things down. As to the second part to your question, uh, I believe there is light at the end of the tunnel. I think that this was uh, a little bit overdone and that uh, with uh, the uh, Saudis and OPEC, I'm sorry, Saudis and Russia meeting, uh, we could see some positive developments out of that uh, over the next couple of weeks and next couple of months. So I, I don't think we're going back down to, to anywhere near where we were. And I'm frankly surprised that oil's at the level where it is. But I think given the sentiment and, and uh, the uh, tendencies of, to markets to overreact a bit at times, um, it's not a complete surprise. USCFinvestments.com is the website. Uh, John Love, CEO, joining us. Now, for energy bulls, the action continues to be in the natural gas market, uh, quite the opposite of oil. Now, you've got two products linked to natural gas. UNG and UNL are the ETF tickers. So why has natural gas been such a great trade for bulls? You know, it's kind of a similar story uh, or the reverse story of of crude. We have had a just massive surplus of natural gas uh, for years and years. It's uh, it's easy to produce. People, uh, producers, uh, or even burn it off because they can't store it or transport it. Uh, we're ne- we now have kind of a couple things going on. Uh, increased exports of liquid natural gas. And just it's been uh, siphoned down uh, here and there for various reasons. 
uh, so that this year, as as we um, got into the you know early early part of the year in January, we had a spike uh, just based on weather when we had extreme cold weather, and we had a little less natural gas in storage than we'd had uh, in previous years. Now, uh, through the course of this year, uh, as we've built up natural gas heading into winter, uh, we haven't built as much as we have had over the past couple of years. So we have kind of a deficit to the last year and the last five years. So as soon as we got a cold snap, that uh, natural gas just just took off, and we and it's been volatile uh, since that point. So it, you know, in the last couple of years, it's it's probably run uh, right around the three dollar mark, uh, dipping down as low as two, and uh, you know, all of a sudden, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we we spiked above four, and we're now sitting at about four and a half dollars with some volatility in there. So I think that'll continue with the, the low inventories and uh, weather uh, news as it develops, uh, weather events, and uh, de- you know continued declining storage. Uh, we could actually see uh, a multi uh, significant multi-year low later in the winter. John Love, CEO of USCF Investments, is with us. Now, while the U.S. dollar has traditionally been a haven some experts foresee trouble ahead for the dollar due to multi-billion dollar budget deficits and, of course, excessive debt and unfunded obligations. I overheard someone even say that the Federal Reserve could start monetizing U.S. debt. Can you imagine that? Most commodities, as you know, John, are priced in dollars. How do you hedge against currency devaluation? Well, I think um, you raise a good point. Given that commodities are priced in dollars, that tends to be, when the dollar is rising, that's a headwind to, to commodities. If the dollar is falling, it's a, it's a tailwind for commodities. Um, the only way really to hedge is there are uh, certain markets, Japan and Europe, if you're looking into international stocks, there are ETFs out there that actually hedge the currency, um, and those are you know potentially uh, good uh, products when uh, – when uh, the U.S. dollar is is um, rising, but to uh, to hedge against decline in USD, I think you'd pretty much have to look at uh, uh, futures contracts or some other instrument that allows you to uh, take advantage of that decline. Unfortunately, commodities um, they tend to be a good hedge against inflation, but uh, the, the the dollar um, the direction of the dollar is only one factor in the price of commodities. So I don't think it's a fantastic hedge uh, for dollar declines. It's just a, one of the factors that goes into the commodity prices themselves. So I, I'd encourage people that are you know really interested in that to look at currency funds or uh, currency futures as ways to hedge. Or even like a gold-linked uh, ETP would be another way to, to probably hedge against that too, correct? You could you could get some hedging uh, dollar hedging uh, potential with gold, um, but again, there are other drivers in there, so it's not going to be a, a perfect hedge, but it could give you some protection. You're absolutely right. Let's talk about the USCF Summer Haven Private Equity Index Fund, ticker symbol BUY, which received a prestigious award by ETF.com for being one of the top innovative new ETFs out there. Now it tracks publicly traded companies that have similar traits to the companies that that uh, private equity firms have historically invested in or bought. So tell us more about BUY, that's the ticker symbol. Sure. Well, what that fund does, we're actually attempting to bring uh, to uh, everyday investors an asset class that has historically been very difficult to get access to. Now, we're not investing in private equity uh, firms, firms that actually uh, run private equity funds or take fund uh, firms private, and we're not investing in business development communities. We're actually taking the kind of equity positions, public equities, that private equity firms typically like to buy. So we're looking at uh, the profiles of, of certain companies and looking at things like EV to EBITDA and profitability and other uh, factors like that, and essentially trying to build a portfolio that will sort of mirror the return characteristics you could get in a private equity fund after fees. And uh, that's that's really what the fund is trying to do, and I think it's it's an exciting space for investors uh, to, to get access to another way, another diversification tool that they historically haven't had access to without uh, significant barriers. Yeah, and again, that ticker symbol is B-U-Y. That's the USCF Summer Haven Private Equity Index Fund. Well, great interview. As always, John, we appreciate you taking the time. And uh, again, go to uscfinvestments.com. You'll see a broad lineup there of exchange-traded products linked to single commodities like oil, 
as well as natural gas and gasoline and heating oil, and then metals. Uh, they've got a United States Copper Index Fund, ticker symbol CPER, as well as a Broad Commodity Index Fund, USCI. USCI is the ticker symbol on that one. And uh, again, USCFinvestments.com. I'm Ron DeLegge. This is the Index Investing Show. More just ahead when we will come back. You're listening to the Index Investing Show with Ron DeLegge. Go to indexshow.com to enroll in Ron's online classes for investors. Learn how to grow and protect your money. Okay, this is the final countdown for today's trivia. And it's a very easy question to answer. In what year was the first U.S. ETF listed for trading? If you know the answer, you're going to get a signed copy of my book, Gents With No Sense, A Closer Look at Wall Street, 844-305-7800. Give us your first name along with your city. So again, that question, in what year was the first U.S. ETF listed for trading? I'm going to help you. I'm going to make it multiple choice. And there's only going to be three choices. Was it in 2001? Was it in 1993? Or was it in 2008? Which year was the first U.S. ETF listed for trading? Again, 844-305-7800. At Index Shows, where you can tweet the answer. You can also email me, ron at indexshow.com. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's also another way that you can participate. Now, going back to our Twitter feed, a couple of things that I wanted to share with you uh, from Twitter here is what uh, I've been watching and following my Twitter handle at Index Show. Direction Leveraged ETFs uh, had this to say, and they linked SPXL, which aims for triple daily performance to the S&P 500. Over the last 80 years, S&P 500 gained 11.1% when Congress was split, regardless of the party in the White House. So that's, uh, that's an interesting stat. S&P 500 gained 11.1% over the past 80 years when Congress was split, regardless of the party in the White House. So that's sort of the situation we have right now. Will S&P 500 repeat its historical, its historical record, its historical tendency? That's the question. We know that history never is exactly the same as the future, but it does rhyme. And so that would be uh, something that uh, we'll have to just wait and see on. Here is something else. Um, huge numbers of Americans take antidepressants. Nearly 25% of middle-aged women, women are on them. Wow. 25% of middle-aged women in America are an on antidepressants. So my comment on that is, uh, you know, the instability of the masses is rather stable. And there's a lot of things out there in the world that you just look at that would make a person uh, crazy and put them in a situation where they, they feel uh, where there is, is no hope and that they have to get on medications in order to, to overcome these difficulties. Well, you don't. You don't have to rely on medication in order to overcome some of the sad things happening in the world. You really don't. And, but sadly, once you start taking them, you get addicted and it's hard to get off. Here's something else. Uh, I've got a link that shows to an article, a research study, that shows that each of us has two different ages. So you've got a chronological age and a biological age, which I found very interesting. A lot of this uh, depends on, of course, uh, how we live our lives, how we treat our bodies, right? Because someone 50 years old chronologically or on the calendar, someone 50 years old actually might be 65 years old biologically if they've abused their body, if they've not taken care of themselves, if they're not eating right, not exercising, if they got a lot of stress and they're not tackling that. Or they, if they're, they are doing what they should be doing and taking care of themselves, they could be 40. 
They could be 40 years old biologically. So a lot of it goes back to habits. So whatever your chronological or calendar age is, uh, biologically, you might be older or younger, depending on how well or how poorly you're you're taking care of yourself. Here's another um, thing that I've got linked onto our Twitter feed. Uh, Payless, Payless Shoe Store uh, did a unbelievable staging. They basically put up a store, a fake store. I, this was somewhere in Los Angeles, basically showing you know it looked like 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 one of these fancy stores that you might see on Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills and they called it Palesi P A L E S S I sounds like it's italian or french or whatever and but the thing is, is they invited all these people they made it look like it was going to be um you know this new brand of highly exclusive shoes and they priced some of the shoes you know 5 600 dollars but the actual shoes were from Payless Shoes. These were regular shoes that they sell in their regular store. They just basically changed the look of the store, made it look like it was this high fashion boutique. And people were buying shoes that you could get at Payless for less than 50 bucks. They were paying five, $600 and, or, or more for the, the same shoes, but in a fancy store, a boutique store that Payless had staged in Los Angeles so as to prove a point. And so the lesson here, and I, this is a great lesson in psychology, is that people's perception of price, cost, and value are perennially skewed. It's a human thing, right? If we package and position something a certain way, there's something about the way our brains work that that could be more attractive and it could actually end up making an individual or person pay more for that same item versus if it's packaged poorly or put into a, a different setting or scenario. So anyway, I thought that was a very great lesson. And there's a lot of real world applications of, of this uh, staging that Payless Shoe Stores did to us as individuals and in, in, in our financial life, particularly the value of assets to be 844-305-7800 is the number this is the index investing show and i'm your host ronda Leggy. so let's uh let's talk a little bit more about lingo that every etf investor should know we told you earlier about bid ask spreads here is something else i want to familiarize yourself with inav and most um most financial advisors are probably familiar with uh net asset value, if you invest in mutual funds and you're familiar with it, it's calculated by adding up the total value of a fund's holdings minus its liabilities. And then you divide the number of outstanding shares and you arrive at the net asset value, also known as NAV. Well, mutual funds are bought and sold at NAV once a day at the end of the market close, right? ETFs are, are bought and sold intraday at intraday market prices and so for that reason they have something called the i nav that i stands for intraday and this has become a popular way for gauging how well an etf's price is tracking its real net asset value so the intraday net asset value also known as i nav as in victor it provides a real-time look at an etf's asset value versus just the once-a-day typical end-of-market NAV calculation. The INAV is reported every 15 seconds by fund companies to give traders and investors a clearer understanding of whether an ETF's price is trading at a premium or a discount to its underlying assets. There's a new proposal by the Securities Exchange Commission. They're examining the possibility of reducing INAV reporting in the future to just once a day instead of every 15 seconds. Some fund providers claim that changes are justified because reporting requirements are quite burdensome, plus real-time NAV calculations are rarely accurate. So that uh, is a change we could see in 2019 and beyond. We could see INAV reporting uh, 
do or become just the same as NAV. And then one final uh, lingo or piece of lingo that every ETF investor should know, factor investing. Um, ETFs that use factor investing try to exploit attributes that are associated with higher historical returns. Factors like small caps, factors like momentum, low volatility, quality, value, and yield. And so factor ETFs are going to follow that specific factor. Like, for example, value. They're going to just own stocks that are value oriented. So that's another piece of lingo that you should be familiar with factor investing. Well, that does it for another episode of the Index Investing Show. On next week's program, I'll report the winner of our trivia question and that uh, be sure to tune in again next week same time same station The opinions expressed in this broadcast are not necessarily that of our advertisers, sponsors, or broadcast partners. The discussion of investing is general and should not be construed as investment advice or an offer to buy or sell securities. Listeners are responsible for their own investment decisions and results. Before investing in mutual funds or ETFs, always consult a prospectus for risk, charges, expenses, and other information. Read the prospectus carefully before investing. Past performance is not indicative of future results. No reproduction or dissemination of the index investing shows permitted without the expressed written consent of its producers.